Beauty and the Beast Once upon a time, in a very far-off country, there lived a merchant who had been so fortunate in all his undertakings that he was enormously rich. As he had, however, six sons and six daughters, he found that his money was not too much to let them all have everything they fancy, as they were accustomed to do. But one day a most unexpected misfortune befell them. Their house caught fire and was speedily burnt to the ground. With all the splendid furniture, the books, pictures, gold, silver, and precious goods it contained. And this was only the beginning of their troubles. Their father, who had until this moment prospered in all ways, suddenly lost every ship he had upon the sea, either by dint of pirates, shipwreck, or fire. Then he heard that his clerks in distant countries, whom he trusted entirely, had proved unfaithful. And at last from great wealth he fell into the direst poverty. All that he had left was a little house in a desolate place, at least a hundred leagues from the town in which he had and to this he was forced to retreat with his children, who were in despair at the idea of leading such a different life. Indeed, the daughters at first hoped that their friends, who had been so numerous while they were rich, would insist on their staying in their houses now they no longer possessed one but they soon found that they were left alone and that their former friends even attributed their misfortunes to their own extravagance and showed no intention of offering them any help. So nothing was left for them but to take their departure to the cottage, which stood in the midst of a dark forest and seemed to be the most dismal place upon the face of the earth. As they were too poor to have any servants, the girls had to work hard, like peasants, and the sons, for their part, cultivated the fields to earn their living. Roughly clothed, and living in the simplest way, the girls regretted unceasingly the luxuries and amusements of their former life. Only the youngest tried to be brave and cheerful. She had been as sad as anyone when misfortune overtook her father. But soon recovering her natural gaiety, she set to work to make the best of things, to amuse her father and brothers as well as she could try to persuade her sisters to join her in dancing and singing. But they would do nothing of the sort, and, because she was not as doleful as themselves, they declared that this miserable life was all she was fit for. But she was really far prettier and cleverer than they were, indeed. She was so lovely that she was always called beauty. After two years, when they were all beginning to get used to their new life, something happened to disturb their tranquility. Their father received the news that one of his ships, which he had believed to be lost, had come safely into port with a rich cargo. All the sons and daughters at once thought that their poverty was at an end and wanted to set out directly for the town, but their father, who was more prudent, begged them to wait a little, and, though it was harvest time, and he could all be spared, determined to go himself first to make inquiries. 
Only the youngest daughter had any doubt, but that they would soon again be as rich as they were before. Or at least rich enough to live comfortably in some town where they would find amusement and gay companions once more. So they all loaded their father with commissions for jewels and dresses, which it would have taken a fortune to buy. Only Beauty, feeling sure that it was of no use, did not ask for anything. Her father, noticing her silence, said, And what shall I bring for you, Beauty? The only thing I wish for is to see you come home safely, she answered. But this only vexed her sisters, who fancied she was blaming them for having asked for such costly things. Her father, however, was pleased. But as he thought that at her age she certainly ought to like pretty presents, he told her to choose something. Well, dear father, she said, as you insist upon it, I beg that you will bring me a rose. I have not seen one since we came here, and I love them so much. So the merchant set out and reached the town as quickly as possible, but only to find that his former companions, believing him to be dead, had divided between them the goods which the ship had brought, and after six months of trouble and expense, he found himself as poor as when he started, having been able to recover only just enough to pay the cost of his journey. To make matters worse, he was obliged to leave the town in the most terrible weather so that by the time he was within a few leagues of his home. He was almost exhausted with cold and fatigue, though he knew it would take some hours to get through the forest. He was so anxious to be at his journey's end that he resolved to go on. But night overtook him and the deep snow and bitter frost made it impossible for his horse to carry him any further. Not a house was to be seen, the only shelter. He could get was the hollow trunk of a great tree. And there he crouched all the night which seemed to him the longest he had ever known. In spite of his weariness, the howling of the wolves kept him awake. And even when at last the day broke he was not much better off. For the falling snow had covered up every path. And he did not know which way to turn. At length he made out some sort of track. And though at the beginning it was so rough and slippery that he fell down more than once. It presently became easier, and led him into an avenue of trees, which ended in a splendid castle. It seemed to the merchant very strange that no snow had fallen in the avenue, which was entirely composed of orange trees, covered with flowers and fruit.